The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christie's.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime. Hello, it's The Week in Art. I'm Ben Luke. This week, Saudi Arabia's unprecedented investment in art and heritage, Julian Knox's London show featuring choirs from the African diaspora, and Michelangelo's Libyan Sybil. A UNESCO conference and archaeological summit in Saudi Arabia are the latest examples of the country's increasing focus on culture as part of the so-called Vision 2030 programme. We look at Saudi Arabia's lavishly funded focus on contemporary and ancient culture and how that relates to ongoing concerns about artistic freedom and human rights abuses in the kingdom. Alia Al-Sanusi, a cultural strategist and senior advisor at Art Basel and to the Saudi Ministry of Culture, joins me to discuss the contemporary art scene. And Melissa Gronland, a reporter on the Middle East for the art newspaper, tells us about the push to reveal hitherto underexplored Saudi heritage. The Sierra Leone-born, London-based artist Julian Knox this week unveiled a new project at London's Barbican Centre, Chorus in Rememory of Flight. I talked to him about an epic endeavour. And this week's Work of the Week is among the greatest drawings ever. Michelangelo's studies in red chalk for the Libyan Sibyl, one of the most distinctive figures on his Sistine Chapel ceiling. The drawing features in Michelangelo and beyond at the Albertina in Vienna. And one of its curators, Constanze Melissa, tells me more about it. A reminder that you can subscribe to the art newspaper by visiting our website and clicking the subscribe link at the top left of the homepage. You can choose from a digital, complete or student subscription. Do also subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening and to our sister podcast, A Brush With, a new series of which began this week. And do leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. Now, in our 250th episode last week, in which we looked to the future, we identified the huge investment in culture in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as a vital issue for the art world in the coming years. Though there's long been an art community in the kingdom, its development has been hugely accelerated since Crown Prince and Prime Minister Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS, launched his so-called Vision 2030 reforms in 2016, with investment in culture and tourism allied to far-reaching social and economic reforms. Commentators on the reforms point to improve women's rights, with women now allowed to drive and travel abroad, for instance, without the permission of male guardians that they would have needed in the past. Artists are reportedly freer from surveillance since 2016 without the attention of Mutawa, the morality police. Meanwhile, archaeology, a formerly relatively neglected field in Saudi Arabia, is subject to the same drive and seen as a crucial element in tourism to the country, a central part of MBS's plan to diversify the heavy fossil fuel reliant economy. The latest UNESCO World Heritage Conference is taking place in the Saudi capital, Riyadh, this week and next. But human rights groups continue to point to the autocratic regime in Saudi Arabia, where freedom of expression is still heavily restricted. Most famously, the Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi was brutally murdered in the Saudi embassy in Istanbul in 2018, with investigators finding direct links to MBS. Men and women have been given lengthy jail terms for criticising the state on social media. Homosexuality, feminism and atheism Atheism are seen as extremist and punishable by flogging and jail. Executions have increased alarmingly, as condemned by the European Union, among others. The Saudi Arabia-led coalition in the long-running armed conflict in Yemen continues to be implicated in war crimes and other violations of international law. Human Rights Watch recently reported that Ethiopian asylum seekers were being shot and shelled as they attempted to cross from Yemen into Saudi Arabia. For these reasons, many see the kingdom's much vaunted reformist image as bogus and see the drive to expand culture and tourism as art washing. Its defenders see the term art washing as lazy and ignorant, given the thriving contemporary art community across Saudi cities and a form of Western narcissism in regarding the Middle East. Across two interviews, we'll explore some of these questions. A bit later, Melissa Gronlund tells us about heritage and tourism, but first, the contemporary scene. Ali al Sanusi is a cultural strategist and senior advisor at Art Basel and to the Saudi Ministry of Culture. She's contributed to Rebecca Proctor's book, due to be published in November, Art in Saudi Arabia, A New Creative Economy. I asked her about the artist community in the kingdom. Alia, in the book written by Rebecca Proctor with your assistance, there's a very clear statement that Saudi Arabia is putting unprecedented resources, quotes, into culture. Why? 
I believe strongly that Saudi Arabia understands that culture has the power to change people's lives, the lives of their own people, but also the lives and really the ambitions of an entire population that has been so closed off from the world. And of course, for the world to see, I think, the real Saudi Arabia. You know, there have been so many misperceptions and misconceptions of what Saudi is as a country, what Saudi is as a culture, who the Saudi people are. And, you know, for me, what better way than culture to explain that to the world? I guess the real dilemma, and it's expressed in the book, is this idea of how can an autocratic regime make it possible to build a creative economy? And also, to what extent can it allow freedom of expression for those artistic communities that you're talking about? Do you think there's a clear answer to that? Or are we still finding a, a way to answer it? I do think there's a clear answer. The clear answer is that there are artists in Saudi Arabia. There is an artistic community there. It already existed prior to Vision 2030. Uh, there were people making art. There were people as patrons of the arts. You know, it didn't just start with Edge of Arabia. Of course, that was one of the first touch points that, let's say, our art world would understand or remember. But, you know, there have been artistic movements in Saudi Arabia throughout the 20th century. And, you know, one of the statements that I think people no longer have this prejudice, but one of the things that so upset and enraged me was when somebody in the West would be like, how is there contemporary art in Saudi Arabia? It's a brand new country. And you're like, no, this is one of the oldest civilizations and peninsulas of inhabited people in the world. And now we see that with Alala. We see that with you know many of these communities and heritage sites. So, you know, Saudi has artists. And I would say Chris Durkan at one of our very first forums put together for 2139. That was his first statement. He said, Saudi Arabia has artists. That's all you need. Right. That's interesting. Now, one of the key aspects of that community is to what extent they are pushing boundaries of freedom of expression. Abdonasa Garem, for instance, at an Art Basel art fair, did a work which was alluding to the murder of Jamal Khashoggi for instance. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting to me is to what extent the artistic communities within Saudi Arabia can address contemporary issues, just as we're seeing international communities of artists doing the same. Well, I think Abdul Nasser is the perfect example of that. You know, in Rebecca's book, which, as you said, I I assisted with and, and really was so proud to help her with, was she had extensive interviews with Abdul Nasser. And he's very clear in his statements. And he is absolutely a part of the artistic community. I've had several friends who have visited him at his studio in the last couple of months and years. And, you know, Abdul Nasser made a work of art that had such illusions, but was able to continue making and doing and being a proud Saudi citizen. Right. And there's this idea that quite often, if issues are confronted in the work of artists in Saudi Arabia, it's done through veiling and symbolism. There's a nice quote from an artist which says that you find your voice in between the restrictions. Can you give it other examples of that? To what extent do you see this happening within the culture, if you like? To what extent are artists using symbolism and metaphor and so on to address those issues? I think the classic example is Manal Doyen. I mean, I think that you really have to look at the historical, the pre-Vision 2030 examples of artists who were really trying to make those statements. Uh, Manal Doyen, you know, the very famous beads, you know, with the women's names and matrilineal ancestry, the doves with the papers that they were required for permission. And, you know, those are all rights now that women have been afforded in the last three and four years. I think, you know, one of... My favorite moments, and it gives me tingles, is a very prominent, well-known artist in her 60s. Every time I bring her people, and she's a very dear friend, we spend a lot of time together, she says to them that she thinks Mohammed bin Salman has done more for women's rights in modern history than any other human being. And this is a woman who has daughters, she is a wife, she has friends and a community, and she just sees her life having changed so much for the better and absolute freedom in a way that she never could have imagined. But would you agree that there is absolute freedom? Because there are still restrictions on women's rights, aren't there? Feminism is still technically illegal, right? I would say it's a a very different way of verbalizing. I mean, people in America, I mean, Beyonce only recently declared herself a feminist. There is a 
you know, kind of strange, let's say, between the connotation and denotation of what feminism is. And most of the women I see are incredibly strong. And by my definition of feminist, they are very strong feminists. Look at Rima Bendad, Princess Rima Bendad, who is the ambassador to the United States. I cannot imagine a more eloquent, intelligent vision of female empowerment in Saudi Arabia than her. Right. And, and Manal al Dawayan has said, actually, that she has noticed a change in the way her work is shown. Is that right? In the sense that she is seeing her works going into institutions now where before there would have been restrictions which would not have allowed that to be displayed. Is that correct? Perhaps that's only something I think she could answer because I don't even know what institutions there would have been before, right. except for, you know, of course, as I said, Edge of Arabia with these, you know, the pop-up shows, 2139, also just once a year, there wasn't an institutional setting. Right. But nonetheless, the Ministry of Culture does still oversee, to a certain extent, what goes into exhibitions, as in there are artists who are saying, yes, there are certain freedoms, but still there is a, there's an overall framework within which we have to act. Is that your perception? I don't think so. And I mean, I just want to be very, I'm not a spokesperson for the no, Ministry of Culture. Of course, of course, I am a senior advisor to them and have, you know, very proudly worked on several projects. I mean, there are governmental parameters that any government has, the State Department or British Council when they show at the Biennales. I have never witnessed or seen any kind of censorship or parameters that I would say were such. And I think Phil Tenari, actually in your publication, the art newspaper, had an excellent quote on that and, and kind of explanation of the ways in which things could and should be shown. I think it was also about the Warhol show in Alala, you know, that it was about celebrity when there were these questions about why were there not certain Warhols there? The show was about celebrity. So I think I have not seen anything besides that, just the parameters of curatorial understanding. Right. One thing I wanted to ask about was queer expression, because, of course, it is still illegal to be homosexual in Saudi Arabia. Huge tranches of the art community are queer and LGBTQ. Can you actively have freedom of expression in an artistic community if that plurality of voices is denied to an entire culture? I don't see it as a denial. I, for example, understand that within actually much Arab culture, public displays of affection are not encouraged between heterosexuals even. So there is just a certain way of being and a certain way of acting in public. For example, Wolfgang Tillmans came to Saudi Arabia with us many years ago, and he you know, did an entire series and actually one of the first, let's say, cover image from his the Tate show, which traveled, I believe, um, several destinations, was a Saudi man wearing a kind of bright purple thobe leaning against his car. You know, that had a certain connotation, I would say. And I think that it was, to me, illustrative that people can be who they want to be. And I think, you know, you look at every ministry website, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the visa, tourist e-visa, there's a very clear line that asks, and it says, you know, the FAQs. And it says, you know, if I'm a homosexual or I'm an LGBTQ community member, am I allowed uh, to visit Saudi Arabia? And it says, we do not ask anyone their personal preferences. And we allow, and there's, it's a very clear line and it's so thoughtful. And I would say that that is the only thing I've ever seen and experienced in Saudi culture. But I suppose there's a difference between being LGBTQ and keeping it quiet and being able to express yourself freely, though, isn't there? I have not seen any desire by someone not to be who they want to be in Saudi Arabia or in actually many countries across the Middle East. I can't answer your question because I am not a part of that community. So I haven't, let's say, had the desire to illustrate myself in that way. But I, of course, have many friends who are, and I've never heard nor seen anyone, let's say, inhibit themselves to be who they want to be. Right. And in terms of the wider distribution of art, if you like, across Saudi Arabia, one of the things we've seen in other nations is massive architectural projects and so on. Is there a sense that Saudi Arabia is doing it differently? As in, do you think that we will see these great star architect projects opening across Saudi Arabia over the coming years? Or do you feel that because its focus is on local communities of artists, that that is the direction that they will follow and it will be built from the art as opposed to built from architectural structures? 
I think because Saudi Arabia is so vast, you will see both. I mean, my career really began when the UAE announced, you know, Saudi at Island. And of course, then you had our Dubai. And it's very different because Saudi Arabia is so large. The population is so much larger than any of its neighbors. So you're able to do both. You're able to focus on the local, nurture the local, and you're also able to engage with the international artistic and architectural communities. So absolutely, you will see both. Right. In terms of what happens next, one of the things I'm conscious of is that it's being said by lots of people that art is a kind of agent of change. Obviously, there have been accusations of art washing mm -hmm. and that actually that the art is being used to cover up the human rights abuses in the country. But to what extent do you think art can be an agent of change, which can change those human rights? Or to what extent do you see it as being a kind of emblem of the creativity of a nation within the restrictions that currently exist? I think the artists who at least we have uh, seen emerge uh, in this moment in the last 20 years, particularly, really believe that they are part of a positive forward movement of their country. They are so patriotic. They have been working at this far before Vision 2030 and now are so excited by the resources that are being put into it, even if they're exhausted by all the projects that they're getting and, and having to, to deliver. But it's been for them a really exciting and happy moment because the artistic community has been at the forefront of pushing forward change and having these conversations in a way that only they have understood as people who have lived in this community, people who are either ethnically Saudi or have emigrated there over the years and feel strongly about their identity. So the artistic community has, is absolutely a part of, of this positive change and of trying to translate to the West. I think it's just so preposterous and arrogant for the West to reject artists when you know, we're kind of constantly shown and seen, oh, artists are you know, meant to be embraced and you know, it's separate from their government. And one of my dearest friends in New York is you know, kind of grappling with this current moment. And she says what's so upsetting for her is that so many progressives in the United States are progressive on every single issue except for Palestine, for example, you know, and so there's a blind spot. And I think there has been a blind spot to Saudi Arabia for a long time. And I think it is changing and changing, of course, hoping for the better. And, you know, those blinders are gradually being opened. Alia, thank you so much. Thank you. The book I mentioned, Art in Saudi Arabia, A New Creative Economy by Rebecca Ann Proctor with Ali al Sanusi, is published on the 30th of November by Lund Humphreys and priced £19.99. Now, as I speak, the 45th session of the UNESCO World Heritage Committee is taking place in the Saudi capital, Riyadh, and continues until the 25th of September. In the historic city of Alula, meanwhile, the three-day World Archaeology Summit concludes on the 15th of September. These events are emblematic of the new investment in archaeology and heritage in the kingdom, and we asked Melissa Gronland, a reporter for the art newspaper in the region, to tell us more. Melissa, there's a UNESCO World Heritage Conference. There is also a World Archaeology Summit in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is making a big push in the field of heritage. Tell me more. Well, in the way that Saudi Arabia is making a big push across all sectors. So under the Vision 2030 reforms, you have football dominating the headlines. You have contemporary art being kind of created as an institutional discipline there, which is not to say that it didn't exist before. And heritage is another one of those sectors that Saudi Arabia is moving into, not just within the country, but in terms of international standing. It wants to be a major player in the field in terms of the bodies that perform you know, emergency threat response under cultural heritage and threat, or in terms of excavating what they have in their own kingdom and showing that to the world. There's a great story that you mention in the article that you've written for the art newspaper about this subject, in which you've got a quote from an Iraqi archaeologist. And the evidence of the Saudi Arabian state's desire to pull the best people within the field of archaeology in the Middle East is really expressed in what he told you. Tell me more about that. Yes, yeah, this is an Iraqi archaeologist that has been working in the field for maybe 20, 30 years. He's really respected 
and he has never been to Saudi Arabia. He's never been invited. He's never had any dealings with them. And then all of a sudden, he gets not one email, but two emails in quick succession over the summer, asking him to come to the World Archaeology Summit that you've mentioned, and another event in December, also in Alula, putting him up in the finest hotels, flying him over, and really inviting him to be part of this high-level gathering of cultural heritage experts, archaeologists, conservators, scientists from all around the world. You know, this is what Saudi Arabia is doing in art, and this is what they're doing a lot across all the sectors in that they have vast resources at their disposal, and they are kind of going in guns blazing. They're inviting the highest level people to the UNESCO summit, kind of the Olympics of the cultural heritage field. And they are doing it in such a way that people don't want to say no. You know, they want to be where the other key leaders are going to be. And, um, and Saudi is preparing to make a name for itself in the field. Another interesting thing in your article that you've written is this idea that there's actually been very little study of the history and archaeology of Saudi Arabia. Why is that? I think there are three main reasons, Ben. One of them is that there has been no tourist infrastructure. So I, I remember when I first visited the country in 2017, I got into a cab in Jeddah, which was a, you know, a really ungulfed thing to do, to get into a cab from the street. And I remember the driver did a triple take. like He looked back at me once and then again, and then literally a third time, because there were just no tourists in the country. There was You were working there or you were living there. I mean, that was because they didn't allow tourist visas. So you had to be invited. So I went to the one museum. I took the cab down to Al Balad, which is a World Heritage Site, which is the old town of Jeddah, and a collection of crumbling and beautiful old houses with these carved uh, moshrabiyas, which are the screens over the windows, and beautiful carved doors, amazing old mosques. And I went to the museum that I had read about online, which is meant to be open, and it was closed. They decided not to open that day. And that was kind of the attitude towards not just tourism, but heritage generally. It wasn't a priority because there weren't people from the outside coming to look at it. And it was a country bent on modernization. So um, in reporting the piece, one of the people I spoke to is Munir Bushinaki, who's an incredible Algerian archaeologist and a real expert in the field of cultural heritage. He's been senior at UNESCO, head of ICRAM. And he was one of the people who helped inscribe Al Balad as a World Heritage Site in 2014. And what he said at the time was that, you know, the locals just didn't understand why. They said, why do we want to preserve these houses? They're falling down. We want places with air conditioning. You know, it, it was a country looking at the future. And now, of course, they want, as part of Vision 2030, I think the figure they give is they want 10% of GDP to come from tourism by 2030. So part of that is having, you know, heritage sites and, and museums that people can come visit and people can come and understand about Saudi Arabia. But there's a second, slightly more contentious reason for the lack of understanding of what is in Saudi. And that's something called the Jahaliya. And this is this idea under more strict interpretations of Islam. Um, the Jahaliya refers across all of Islam, to the time before Muhammad. So it's translated as the ignorance. And under Wahhabism, which was the very strict interpretation of Islam that kind of ruled Saudi from the 1980s, 1990s, and is now dissipating today, any study or research into that time was prohibited. So that is given as one of the reasons that, you know, Saudi wasn't looking into its past. And I don't know how true that is, if I'm honest. You know, I I think it must have been true for some religious clerics, but there are examples, you know, even of al Balad in 2014 or Hegra, the first World Heritage Site in 2008. That's the amazing Nabataean tombs in al Ula. That was inscribed in 2008. So that was still before any of these reforms started. And there were museums built for the country's centenary in 1999. I know there was some plans for a airport that were halted because of Bronze Age fines. So there are lots of examples that go against this idea that the religious outlook of the country kind of stymied all study of what was inside. But at the same time, you can't deny there was very little excavation. There was very little uh, research being done. And that is all happening now, as I said before, you know, at fever pitch. They are investing in archaeologists. They're bringing, you know, top archaeologists over to Saudi, not just in these meetings, but they're hiring them. They're training up young archaeologists. They are trying to find out what's in the ground, and then they'll move on towards classifying the material, building out new narratives, and then finally exhibiting those to the public in museums and, and different heritage sites across the country. 
Right. You spoke to Adam Wilkinson, who's an example of those kind of international experts who's now been brought on as a permanent position working on heritage. He was at Edinburgh World Heritage. He's now at the Deria site. So tell us more about that. That's an example then of that sort of very concerted effort to bring in international experts on heritage to transform the kind of culture relating to the heritage, right? Yes, exactly. Diri Iga was the capital of the first Saud dynasty. So it's a collection of 18th century mud brick dwellings and settlements. And the crown jewel is the Salwa Palace, which is this quite large mud brick palace that's kind of, let's say, half still there. You know, there are no roofs anywhere. You can see that there must have been rooms. You can see that it must have been quite an extensive and beautiful palace, but any kind of ornamentation has been worn away because of the material of mud brick. Right. But um, they are trying to make that into kind of their symbol for the nation. So every time you visit Saudi, you're taken to this event. When they hosted the G20 leaders, they got taken to that event. I think I saw the UNESCO World Heritage Conference, which started three days ago from when we're speaking now, they went to Al Salva Palace during Nur Riyadh, which is a festival of light. I went to see a Robert Wilson installation that was projected onto the palace. So, you know, that is an example of a site that is of tremendous significance in terms of the history of the nation, tremendous significance in terms of understanding how people lived in Arabia, but also going to be a major tourist site. They're also building luxury hotels, food and beverage options all around the Diriya area. And that's also where the Contemporary Art Biennial is being held. So in that one site, you see the, all the, the multiple impulses of this drive going on. On the one hand, the research and, and the desire to know more about the country's past, and at the same time, a desire to develop it for the present and as a place of economic opportunity. Now, as with all aspects of the whole Vision 2030 program and this whole idea of this big cultural soft power push in Saudi Arabia, there are deeply problematic elements that are in the background. And I wanted to address the elephant in the room, that is Yemen. Mm. Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states have been at war with militias armed by Iran in Yemen for the best part of a decade. And we have seen terrible human rights abuses on the border where, for instance, Ethiopian refugees have been shot and shelled as they have attempted to come into Saudi Arabia. And in terms of the context of this conversation, there has been damage to heritage in Yemen. Can you tell me more about that? The situation on cultural heritage in Yemen is, is atrocious. It's, it's terrible. There has been so much destruction on both sides, in the north and the south. They're leaking antiquities. There was a story, I think it came out a few days ago, of these funerary statues that were found in an East London design shop. And someone found them and brought them to the v I mean, just incredible. Astonishing. Yeah. It's just bleeding antiquities. So uh, I spoke to um, the director of the Dahmar Regional Museum, which is a, a regional museum, but quite an important one. And it had been used as um, a weapon storehouse by the Houthis. So they used it as they used many other building sites to store their weapons, you know, around the area. And then it was hit in 2015 by a coalition missile. So that's a UAE Saudi missile. And then because it was storing weapons, it completely blew up. But fortunately, that one museum had been the only museum in Yemen to have been built according to international standards, and it hadn't yet opened to the public. So most of its collection was still in storage. So, you know, amazingly, the director estimates that 75% of it is intact. But what is it, seven, eight years on, they still don't have the ability to investigate the building. So he was saying that there are gangs across all of Yemen who are taking antiquities from the ground or in museums where they've been left and, and free for the taking. And they've just been appearing on Facebook groups in, you know, different private trading sites. And the international community has been quite slow to respond, but they are starting to look at this seriously. The U.S. and Yemen just signed a preliminary agreement, which gives Homeland Security greater authority to intercept artifacts from Yemen at the border. So those are classed as artifacts that are older than 250 years old and tribal artifacts. But it's been classed as a preliminary agreement, suggesting that there is probably more um, serious legislation to come. So that's a step in the right direction. I also know that since the fighting has subsided, you have more people going down to Yemen from the cultural heritage sector to look at sites in the north and the south. 
but you know, it's, it's a question of funding and it's a question of, of access. You know, you can't get to these remote locations easily because they're not safe. And mud brick, which is the, the material of a lot of the old sites in, in Sanaa and across the country, it, it's very porous. So, you know, once there's some damage and once you're unable to maintain it, you know, it can wash away in, in rains, which are increasing because of climate change. So there are so many factors at play in Yemen. But to your point about it being the elephant in the room, I don't think it is the elephant in the room. It's maybe like a mouse in the room. <laughs> and that's because... Heritage, it isn't like contemporary art. You know, in, in the contemporary art sector, you can have people say, I don't agree with Saudi's human rights record, or I don't agree with how it treats its women, and I don't want to work there, I don't want to sell there, I don't want to collaborate. In heritage, you don't really have that luxury. You know, there's just such a need for money. And what heritage is doing is they're always working in places where there are threats because, you know, that's the nature of the business. And places where there are threats are conflict zones or post conflict zones. So they're used to not letting politics get into the way. And that's what you've already seen in Yemen. So in 2017, Aleph was established. This is this kind of young emergency response cultural heritage agency that has been, you know, has been a real success story. They've, they've done a fantastic job in the Middle East, but all around the world. And it was launched in the UAE. Saudi is now the second biggest funder and they're opening an office in Riyadh. But when it was launched in 2017, that was in the middle of the Yemen war. They've done projects in Yemen. They're sending officials down there now to look at sites in the north and the south. So in a way, it's already shown itself not to be the elephant in the room. Melissa, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. You can read Melissa Gronland's report on Saudi heritage in the October print issue of the Art Newspaper on the website at theartnewspaper.com or on our app for iOS and Android. Coming up, Julian Knox on his choral video installation at London's Barbican and Constanza Melissa on Michelangelo's Libyan Sibyl. But first, here's this week's news bulletin. Several UNESCO World Heritage Sites have been severely damaged by the recent earthquake in Morocco. The death toll from the 6.8 magnitude earthquake that struck late last Friday night has climbed to more than 2,000, with many more people injured, according to Moroccan state television. While UNESCO has stressed that the priority is to preserve human lives in the aftermath of such disasters, Eric Fault, the regional director of the UNESCO Office for the Maghreb, said last week that a plan for the second phase of the response was needed, which will include the reconstruction of schools and cultural assets affected by the earthquake. Among the damaged locations is the medieval Medina in Marrakesh, which was inscribed by UNESCO as a World Heritage Site in 1985. Visitors to the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid can now take photographs of Picasso's famous anti-war painting Guernica from 1937 after a ban was lifted by the museum's new director, Manuel Segade. Image restrictions regarding the epic painting, which depicts the horrors of the Spanish Civil War, have been in place for more than 30 years since the work was moved to the Reina Sofia from the Prado Museum in 1992. Segade said photographic accessibility was vital for a young audience who, in his words, live filtered by a screen, and that it was important to pay attention to their way of approaching reality. Vincent van Gogh's painting The Parsonage Garden at Neunen in spring has been recovered more than three years after it was stolen in the Netherlandish city of Lauren in a smash-and-grab raid. The return was negotiated by the Dutch private art detective Arthur Brand, who met a contact on Amstelveld, a small square off Amsterdam's Prinsengracht Canal. The van Gogh was handed over in an IKEA bag. It's believed that those holding the painting were hoping to use it to barter for the release of a prisoner. Painted in March 1884, the work depicts the garden of van Gogh parents. You can read all these stories on the website or the app. We'll be back after this. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Discover art prints, editions and unique works from the 19th century to now across three online auctions at Christie's this September. Until 25th of September, Picasso Ceramics presents a vast array of playful works that radiate Pablo Picasso's joie de vivre. With estimates ranging considerably in value, this sale presents an opportunity to own a piece of Picasso's legacy for emerging and seasoned collectors alike. The sale of prints and multiples welcomed bidding until the 27th of September, featuring editions 
by leading 19th and 20th century artists. Headlining the sale are four screen prints by Andy Warhol from his iconic Myths series, coming from a corporate collection which also boasts a strong representation of post-war American prints. Bidding for contemporary edition runs through the 28th of September, bringing a strong focus on prints and multiples by eminent British artists, including Grayson Perry, Banksy, Caroline Walker, Jade Fadogetimi and more. Visit Christie's London Galleries at 8 King Street in the St James's District until the 26th of September for the public viewing of the lots on offer. Entry is free and open to all. Find out more at christies.com. Welcome back. That is the sound of the Boris Choir, a group of Comorian women in Marseille in France. It's one of several choirs from the African diaspora filmed and recorded by the artist and poet Julian Knox in a 4,000 mile trip around European cities with colonial histories from Lisbon via Barcelona, Rotterdam and Berlin to London. And the film installation resulting from this journey is now on display in the Curve Gallery in the Barbican Centre in London. I went to the Barbican to talk to Julian. Julian, we're standing by the lakeside, I think it's called, at the Barbican. And this is actually a location for your film. Tell us why you wanted to film here. Obviously, the commission came to make a work for the curve, but you wanted to literally make the Barbican part of the piece. It's interesting that you asked me this and actually brought me here, because in 2017, um, Eleanor did the show with Basket. This is Eleanor Nair. Yeah, the Eleanor Nair, the, the curator. I came through after the show, and I took a photo of that same location because ah. I just thought it was you know beautiful fast forward when we're making the piece just thinking about this idea of the square mile in London because that was the way I wanted to sort of come into London using the square mile as a way to talk about the sort of lines between Europe and Africa and the diaspora and one of the gates the seven gates of London is here at the right Barbican here. yeah so when we scouted the location, I just felt like as a space of a sort of offering and call, that space kind of evoked that. And I think the gate was the cripple gate. And I think uh, yes, the yes, church. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's so that we're looking at the church right yeah, now. And that's right. Exactly. Okay. So um, it's quite weird that you chose this space. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. it's, I mean, it's really interesting because... There's multiple roles that this building as a kind of character plays in the space. Because as you say, it's about the square mile and there's a very important moment in the film where a voice tells us that the square mile of London was effectively the centre, the global centre for international slavery. And that is one of the key themes. Tell us how you approached it and what you've done with that theme in terms of this extraordinary journey that you've been on. So when you leave London and go to other cities... And, you know, speaking to the histories of those cities, but also speaking with the people that live in those cities, you realise there are these echoes that keep coming back to London. And as someone from London, London was the last place that I wanted to film. So when I came back with all the stories, I was just like, if I was to bring this down into its most, I guess, basic, sort of simplest form, where should I tackle... Um, and I just thought a square mile, because a square mile is still alive today. You know, it has its own state, it has its own governing body, its own policing. And just the idea that the square mile survived till now, I find it really bizarre. I find it fascinating. So then it was like, what are the ways in to the square mile? And then the seven gates came up. And it just so worked well with the seven cities, the seven seas and water playing that theme. So... That's how we ended up here. I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very much so. The idea of the seven seas, the ocean plays an extraordinary, powerful role in the films. There's particularly one film where a dancer, Dorothy, is almost haunting a space in Marseille, looking over from the harbour to the sea, which, of course, leads to Africa. Yeah. And you sort out communities from Africa, disparate communities from Africa across Europe in particular locations but also specifically sought out choirs did you have choirs in your mind right from the start in a way was it fact finding that led you to it in a way 
So the choir was the first way of, um, I guess, approaching this project. Um, because when I said the project, I did a residency in Amsterdam with We Present. And then at the end of it, I did a performance at Stedelijk Museum. I documented that. And that was the beginning of, like, what would this look like if these choruses were sung or appropriated or remixed in different cities? So then we have sort of what I, I was calling a global chorus. Because in a way, in a cliche way, uh, I feel like the Black Diaspora are almost singing the same songs globally, uh, just in different forms, you know. So that was the beginning of the idea. So the choir was the main part. So then how then I should tackle this? Then water is a big theme in most of my work um, because both, you know, the water is a place of much trauma for us as the black diaspora, especially someone from Sierra Leone, mm. that's Creole. Um, but also the water culturally plays a big role in a spiritual sense. There are loads of ways in which cultures and stories and folklores are told through the Atlantic Ocean. So then using water as a way to map out a route from Sierra Leone to London and from London to these seven port cities in Europe. That's how I landed on to yeah, using water as a, as a way of flight. And when you look at water, in, in especially contemporary culture, you realize these movements are still happening. Migration is still an issue. The water, though it gives us life, it's also being weaponized against, you know, our fellow humans. So then I then thought, well, water is a beautiful way to speak on flight, both physically and spiritually, both historically and contemporarily, you know. The choirs sing individual songs at various points. Yeah. And then they come together at the end with this extraordinary chorus of we are what's left of us and, yeah. and sung with extraordinary beauty and power actually it's a tremendously moving moment in the film we are one we are one what's left of us it seemed to me that that was very deliberate in a way you had their individual voice inflected by different parts of Africa from which they emerged yeah. and then they came together as you say as a kind of global voice there's a sort of episodic nature of the way that you sort of structured the film so that you see this unfolding, right? Yeah, so We Are What's Left of Us is a line from an old poem that I wrote, which is actually the film at the tape um, right now. But then over the period of time, that kept coming up. So I made this melody. We are, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, but, we'll include an excerpt. <laughs> but um, the idea then was what would it sound like we are what's left of us if that song across Europe. And I just love the way how each city made it their own. But then within that, they then added their own personality, their own songs that reminds them of home. So it was both a way to commune together, but also having them present their own identities. And I felt like we are what's left of us also asked this question of if we are the ones that are left, as in humans. What do we do next? How are we then going to think about the future? How are we then think about what's next? That element of future, past and so on is really present in the mood, if you like, of the piece. I was really struck by the fact that, on the one hand, there's this sense of a haunting and a very elegiac feel about the film, but also a sense in which there's a sort of defiance and resistance. Was that a difficult balance to get right because in a way they're opposing moods but also they're interconnected and inextricably so so tell me about how you manage the mood of the piece it's the good old quote of is it langston hughes you know double consciousness right blackness and these these things that we carry on one hand blackness is a joyful thing you know to be black to be alive today you know there are beautiful reasons to be alive and you know and we make beautiful things you know and you hear it in our songs but then at the same time you know, there's other parts of being black which are challenging. And we carry these things with us. It wasn't difficult, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was always the intention of how do you do both? You know, how do you present something beautiful, but also within that, you go deeper with it, you know? Each and every one of the individuals in the film have given me their time and their talent as an offering to the work. So... It was important for me to make it beautiful um, and present them in the best light. But then at the same time, 
I needed to hold the truths that are within the work, you know, within their work and their lives. And those performances, including the ones that were shot right here at the Barbican and then in a Berlin subway with XSA and then Dorothy who mentioned in Marseille earlier on, they're extraordinary in their own right, actually. I mean, yeah. it, it, as you say, it's a kind of offering to the work. Yeah. But one feels, in a way, your camera as a kind of spectator of this wonderful creativity in its own right. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, someone else is asking me, did, did I choreograph it? I was like, no. Nah. These were all moments of encounters where... You know, Dorothea was like, meet me, you know, at the edge of Marseille. And I wanted to do this movement sequence as a dialogue to my grandma that just passed. The performance that she did was in dialogue with her grandma. So she turned up with this silver dress, but she wrapped it in her grandmother's fabric. So when she came, she, you know, opened her bag, took out this fabric, opened the fabric, and then explained why she wrapped it, you know, as a grandmother and gave it to her. And she wanted to have this dialogue from Marseille to home. And I thought that was quite profound. And then with Esauce, he was meet me at this station in Berlin um, and he had a boombox with him and he just pressed play and we just looked, you know. But I think it's also important that I didn't just look, I also engaged, which is why I, I guess the poetry comes in and the conversations then come in. And, you know, I didn't only want to just pry on people, you know. I wanted to feel implicated too in the work. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because it's sort of a position but somewhere between a kind of orchestrator and curator of the material that you're shooting, yeah. but also as, as a witness, a spectator. It's a yeah. really interesting balance. But you mentioned about the poetry, and it seems to me that's the kind of uniting thread of all the work, everything here, but also your work generally. You began yeah. as a poet, didn't you? Tell us more. Yeah, so I failed at making YouTube videos, YouTube poetry videos. <laughs> Because with the work that I'm making now, you have to spend time with them and you should have to give, you know, quick. So, and I think the art world embraced the videos that, you know, I was making for my poems. And that's how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the inquiry came from thinking about how would poetry move from the page to otherwise technology. Um, think, if you think about the print and press as you know, once upon a time, a new technology. Now that we've got, you know, video work, rather than me just talking to camera, how can I also think about poetry being, you know, in cinema and, you know, in that space and the poems could live and come alive and be animated and I don't have to be there to read them. We talked about the choirs, of course, but the sound is such a extraordinary sculptural experience of this work you've really thought Paul about Paul Cousins he's the sound designer now okay well it. Paul Cousins has done a fantastic job because it apart from anything else if you're telling us about a journey one of the things that you can do in the curve is lead us on a journey and it really does that really effectively so it seems to me you're thinking about poetry and the, in the text through the pieces in the same way that you're thinking about sound as a kind of on a kind of line that pulls us through, right? Yeah, so one of the first things uh, in conversation with Eleanor, the curator, was how do I, because I come from a performance poetry background, how do I use the space as a performance space? Right. But also, how do I use it as a space of encounter? Um, so those are the two things that went into thinking about the, the curve as a, you know, as a long corridor. How do you use the space as a space of encounter but also coming from a performance background, how do I bring people into a performance space? So the first sound you hear, man, I mean, um, yeah. those are voice exercises before you start singing. Right. So if the audience wants to, they can join in <laughs> before they step into the performance. And also I wanted to figure out a way to engage the audience too, to not just come and just look at the walls, but also felt like, they're within the work, you know? Yeah. Um, we are all what's, what's left of us. You, know? you have to sort of limber up because it, you're not demanding a lot of your audience, but you want your audience's engagement. You want them to have a physical and intellectual engagement with this work. Yeah, and it's that thing of like bringing in the poetry practice where if you read a poem, you have to do a little bit of work. <laughs> and I wanted that to be present when I'm moving the work into, I guess, video installation work. I wanted that engagement, the criticality of that to also be within that space. So, yeah, I do hope that people will do more work after. I do too. 
Julian, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Julian Knox, chorus in rememory of Flight, is at the Curve in the Barbican Centre in London and online on We Present until the 11th of February 2024. Julian is also in the group show A World in Common, Contemporary African Photography at Tate Modern in London until the 14th of January 2024. And finally, it's time for the work of the week. Michelangelo's drawings for the figures on the Sistine ceiling are regarded as some of the most significant drawings in history. And the figure that's been described as the most graceful of all those on the ceiling is the Libyan Sibyl, one of the five prophetesses in Michelangelo's design. The sheet of paper featuring the Renaissance master's drawings for the Libyan Sibyl is on loan from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York to the exhibition Michelangelo and Beyond at the Albertina in Vienna, where it's one of about 140 works works on paper. Constanze Melissa is one of the show's curators and she told me about this marvellous sheet of sketches. Constanze, I'm conscious that we're going to be talking about one of the greatest works in the history of works on paper. Yeah. There are not many drawings that are more important than this one, are there? Yeah, no, I don't think so too. It's a drawing for the Sicilian fresco and the Sistine Chapel and, and this is one of the most influential artistic creation of all times, I think. Yeah, it's made in red chalk and that's really significant in terms of dating the drawing, isn't it? Because it, yeah. the red chalk was from the kind of second phase of the Sistine ceiling. Yeah. Tell us about that. I think it's important to say that it was in 1502 at the behest of Pope Julius II that Michelangelo largely alone commenced his efforts about the ceiling frescoes in the Sistine Chapel. And it's not only the Libyan Sibyl, it's also a numerous drawing. The artist prepared the dynamic inner turmoil and um, contact postures of his athletic nudes, also the famous Inudi. Yes. The finished frescoes features these 20 naked young men as bearers of um, heavy bronze medals, uh, with the required effort clearly manifests in their um, physical tensions and the qualities of the artist. Nations canon that we are talking about in the whole exhibition are also apparent in these powerful heroic bodies of the Sibyls. Yes. And the Sibyls are prophecies of the Old Testaments. They are women. And like all of Michelangelo's female figures, and they are likewise based on the idol of the male model. And that's what our exhibition is going about. The exhibition Michelangelo and Beyond explore the origins and impacts of a canon that was to reign for 300 years as a standard against all the depictions of the male nude were measured. Yeah. Tell us about why he worked from men in order to produce drawings of women. It was the time all the female um, figures were drawn after male models. And in case where Michelangelo had painted female figures, such as those of the Old Testament prophecies in the Sistine Chapels, it had been nude males who served him as models. And women, thus hidden by Michelangelo's shadows, would for centuries remain the unknown dark side of the moon. It's another main topic in our exhibition because draped in, in flowering garb, a woman was fit to serve as a symbol of work virtue and um, stripped naked she became a witch or a venus but that it wasn't and that's what our exhibition about the canon is, is talking about tell me more about red chalk because is it right that red chalk allowed you to be much finer in your depiction than black chalk had yeah. so in other words there's a refinement in michelangelo's drawing that emerges through the very material he's using yeah, sure. Because you have to imagine, you can see the emotions. You can see the emotions in the faces with the red chalks much better. And you can also see the muscles and you, so you can see um, the parts of the body much better than with black chalk or in the finished fresco. I think so. So it's a very important part of his work, the red chalk drawings. And Raphael takes this over from Michelangelo. That's right. Yeah, I want to talk about the legacy in a bit. You've already referred to it on a couple of occasions, but just while we're dwelling on the on the drawing itself, I want to explore the sheet. He packs this piece of paper with so much visual information. It's the mind of a genius writ large, isn't it? You can see the working of his brain, the working of his hand in unison, creating this extraordinary, wonderful drawing. 
Yeah, I, I think it in all of Michelangelo's drawings, as well as in his sculptures, that the idol of the male nude charged by inner tensions. And this is presented largely free from narrative accessories. And that's what makes these drawings that great, I think. And Michelangelo developed this idea around 1500 based on an interplay between his study of nature and the model embodied by the ancient monumental sculptures. This is very important because these sculptures mm -hmm were being rediscovered during the Renaissance. For example, the Laocon in 1506 or the, the Hercules Farnese. And with all these things he worked and he took this over in this in this pastel talk drawings. Or um, if, you, if you take a, a look at the dead Christ, mm. the mother, the, the Pieta, who is crying for her boy. And with pastel talk, everything gets better and gets much more emotional. Yeah. The parallel with sculpture is really important in this drawing of the Libyan Sibyl because yeah. there's a sculptural feel about this figure. It, it, it evokes stone yeah. as much as it evokes the human body. Yeah, I think so too. And I think it's fascinating that um, he shows us this male body with this um, female looking face and you see the face in the foreground much bigger and you see how mm. he tries to, to make it more female and, and you, you see that the red shark makes great shadows. Yeah, it really does. So I think it's a great piece of paper. There's this wonderful element, which is the toe. There's two individual drawings of the toes, mm -hmm. and then there's also the foot as a whole. Yeah. And that, that again, I love that you're seeing his thinking happening here. Yeah, and the Libyan Sibyl is, is carrying a book in the finished fresco, and you see how heavy it must be, and you see the strength going into her feet, you know? Yes, absolutely. Down to the toe, yeah. Absolutely right. And so yes, it's the, it's the weight of the book forcing her to press her foot down, yeah. and then also the wonderful yeah. stress on her hand as well, so, so that, yeah. that you can feel that weight as he's working out exactly how the hand should look as it carries the book. The wonderful thing is it's that extraordinary balance he achieved, it seems to me, between the strength that we're talking about, that sort of tension, but also incredible delicacy. And you, again, in the drawings, you really have that, or perhaps even more than in the frescoes, would you say? Yeah, I would say. I would definitely say because you can focus on these details much better than in the, in the finished fresco. And the finished fresco is always telling you a story about whatever. But in the drawings and in the, in the red child drawings, you see all the little details. And that's why we are showing that much drawings of Michelangelo. We show in our exhibition no painted work. We just show some um, sculptures and uh, the drawings because at the drawings you can see at the best how they this canon Michelangelo created over the years is growing because in the painted pictures or in the frescoes, he's telling a story and then in the drawings, he's, he's studying. Absolutely. And, and as you've mentioned, it's legacy because, of course, yes, he's looking back to antiquity. Yeah. But then this carries art and drawing into a whole new dimension going forwards because wonderfully, I mean, this isn't one of them, but I know that Rubens owned several of the drawings. The drawings that are in the Albertina now yeah. were owned by Rubens. Yeah. So you literally see that sort of influence carried forward in his work and also, of course, of numerous Mannerists who looked at yeah. Michelangelo's drawings and, and worked from them. Yeah, I, I think the 16th century's Mannerist style exaggerated Michelangelo's ideal, giving rise to, to elegant, elongated and stretched figures. And the 7th century's relationship with Michelangelo was dominated by two antipodes. On the one hand, it was Rubens who admired and collected Michelangelo's drawings, and he came to view his Florentine forebear as an unsurpassed model. And on the other hand, opposing this master's um, stance, it was um, Rembrandt mm. who insisted on uh, portraying non-idolized, realistic image of human beings and knew no fear of ugliness in doing so. So he was the other great, great head of the 17th century. Right. And he too, of course, was a brilliant master Rembrandt of the kind of that sort of toughness, but delicacy that we see in this drawing, of course. Yeah. In terms of how it affected the academic tradition going forward, you talk about that a lot in the exhibition, don't you? Because it becomes mm -hmm. this kind of drawing becomes the kind of benchmark for the teaching of drawing in academies. 
Yeah, that you can see in our drawings that we show from the 18th century. And the 18th century saw the central neoclassicist masters as um, Pompeo Batoni or Anton Raphael Mengs mm -hmm. rediscover um, Michelangelo's exemplary balance between the idol put forth by ancient sculptures and the study of nature. So they go back to what Michelangelo did, free from Rubens or um, Rembrandt. They go back to that what Michelangelo did. And I think it was admissed in the Industrial Revolution and the major wars of the 20th century, that this idolized image of the human being ultimately lost its signification once and for all. So the 18th and the 19th century, with the academic part, it wasn't very close to Michelangelo and then it was over. Constanze, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you. Michelangelo and Beyond is at the Albertina in Vienna until the 14th of January next year. And that's it for this episode. You can find us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Tan Audio, and on Facebook, Instagram, and Threads. The Week in Art is produced by Julie Mahalska, Alexander Morrison, and David Clack. And David's also the editor and sound designer. Thanks also to Daniela Hathaway and to our guests, Alia, Melissa, Julian, and Constanze. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. The Week in Art is sponsored by Christie's. Visit christies.com to find out more about the world's leading auction house since 1766. Auction, private sales, online, art, anytime.